This podcast is brought to you by North Carolina's Electric Cooperatives. This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Thank you for tuning in, NC Spin. Just about when we thought we had seen it all so far this year, along comes an earthquake to make a pretty eventful year even more notable. This week, our panel talks about the opening of school, the latest on COVID-19, and 12 weeks and counting before the election. And, of course, we'll ask the panel to tell us something we don't know. Our panel this week includes Anna Bevan Gravely, Executive Director of NC Free, Rob Schofield, Director of NC Policy Watch, Chris Fitzsimon, director of State's Newsroom, and John Hood, syndicated columnist and author. We'll begin our uninterrupted debate after these brief messages from our underwriters. Your life is more flexible and efficient than ever, and your energy is too. See how North Carolina's electric cooperatives are building a brighter future for the rural communities we serve at ncelectriccooperatives.com slash brighter. The big issue in 2020 is health care. Let's talk basics. You are the key to your own personal health, but there is strong evidence that if you have a relationship with a family physician, your quality of life will be better, you'll likely live longer, and you'll have 33% lower health care costs. Your family doctor knows you, has your medical history, and can quickly diagnose health problems. Family Physicians, your trusted health care advisor for life. I want to thank my good friend Brad Crone for sitting in for me last week. Let's begin the spin. Last week, we had a segment about the elections, now just 12 weeks away. Developments are coming fast, so let's talk about them. The Democratic National Convention begins Monday, and on Wednesday of this week, Joe Biden selected Kamala Harris to be his running mate. Will the selection help him in winning North Carolina? Why or why not? Anna Bevan? Well, it's definitely a pick that he's hoping is going to help in North Carolina for sure. Um, This week has been largely focused on the historic nature of her pick. Uh, And so we're going to take some time to really see what that bump looks like and if it holds. Um, The big thing is that Trump has lost massive ground with women. Um, From the last um, Civitas poll in May to this one, he's down 16 points with women. And they're really hoping this is going to help. Yeah. John Hood, what do you think? Usually vice presidential picks don't really matter, even though they get a lot of attention, they don't sway that many voters. But lots of people think that 2020 is an exceptional year because it is widely expected that if Joe Biden were to be elected president, he would not run for a second term. So the vice presidential pick matters more. In that instance, then, I don't really see a lot of upside for voters who are or might still be undecided in this race. I think because uh, Kamala Harris is one of the most left-wing senators in the U.S. Senate, according to her voting record and background, I think that it probably is a net negative uh, for the, the Democratic ticket. Chris Fitzsimon, does Harris help in North Carolina? Well, I think she does help. It is a historic pick. I think it does energize women. It energizes, uh, I think, the Democratic base. On the other hand, it, to, to hear somebody call her one of the most left-wing senators, the Republican National Committee and Trump himself have attacked him, have attacked Harris sometimes for being too left-wing, sometimes for being too tough on crime. So they're obviously confused. They're so confused that Donald Trump is now dabbling in the racist birther theory that he accused of <laughs> Barack Obama of. So clearly they're worried about Kamala Harris, which means to me it was a good, solid pick for Biden. Rob Schofield, your take on this. Yeah, I think Biden is leading in North Carolina, and what she does is what all good vice presidential candidates do is not hurt the ticket. Uh, I think she does spur some enthusiasm amongst voters of color, women, uh, but the main thing she does is she's a calming, solid influence, doesn't have any big negatives. I think uh, to that extent it helps somebody who's already ahead. Anna Bevan, two weeks ago, Jim Blaine, who is a longtime strategist in our state Senate, spoke at a John Locke Foundation event and hinted that Republican dominance in our state might be coming to an end. He said he foresees a, quote, tsunami similar to the 72 Nixon route. This time it would favor Democrats. Your organization constantly studies the mood of our state. Is Blaine mirroring what you're seeing? Well, when you look at the campaign finance reports from um, from quarter two, it definitely does look that way for sure. There's a huge fundraising gap between um, the Republicans and the Democrats, but that's just one piece of the puzzle. Um, the campaigns that or the uh, elections and races that we're watching at NC Free 
are really close. They're really competitive, and and that looks like both Republican and Democrat candidates being being really strong and having really great opportunities in the end, and it's going to be a fight to the end. Chris, uh, uh, Blaine said that the only Republican left on the Council of State might well be Ag Commissioner Steve Troxler. What do you think? Well, I think that for Jim Blaine to say that publicly is fascinating. I think that's sort of the uh, growing into not conventional wisdom, but a possible scenario. I think it does show one thing. Uh, every poll, we, we talk a lot about polls, and there are some ones that were released this week. I think that, interesting, no one is showing Roy Cooper in much trouble. And we think of the, the top of the ticket. I think Trump is going to be the big issue. But if Cooper overwhelmingly beats Dan Forrest, as it looks like he will if we were voting today, that will have dramatic implications, I think, on down the ticket, on John, down the ballot. John, let's talk about the poll. Civitas released a, a new poll this past week. They show Donald Trump up by three points in North Carolina. They show Tom Tillis up by two points in North Carolina. And Roy Cooper up by 12 points in North Carolina. They're usually pretty accurate, aren't they? Y yes. Uh, I think the numbers may be a little different than that, Tom. But uh, th there was also an em Emerson College poll. I looked at the average of all the uh, polls taken in August this year. I also looked at them in the past, and it's important to, to look at August polls, they tell you some important things. But this time, four years ago, Roy Cooper was ahead of Pat McCrory by six points. Now, of course, he won by two-tenths of a point. About this time, uh, four years ago, Clinton was ahead in North Carolina by two. She ended up losing by four. In 2014, when Tom Tillis was on the ballot for the first time for U.S. Senate, Hagan was ahead by a point or two uh, in August and ended up losing by a couple of points. Uh, Things can change between August and November. I do think that a, a, a Democratic uh, significant victory is a very plausible scenario, but there are others, including tightening of all of these races by November. Rob Schofield, another uh, uh, development this past week was a judge uh, threw out, essentially, or refused to stay uh, a Dan Forrest's uh, lawsuit against Governor Cooper, essentially saying he didn't see that Forrest could prevail in a real uh, court of law. Uh, your reaction to that? I'm not surprised. I think that was a, a logical ruling. I think the, the judge realized that the Council of State is not a legislature. It's an executive branch. It's led by the governor. I think it was a Hail Mary by, by uh, Forrest. He realizes he's way down in the polls. He's being a good soldier. He's putting up a good fight. He knows he's not going to win this election, so he's trying everything he can. But once he started having campaign events and without masks and saying that masks don't uh, control the virus, I think he, he he cinched losing the election. And and this is just another part of that that he's he's you know he's done his part, but he's not going to be able to keep going Chris, much our, longer. Our good friend Michael Bitzer, who is a political science professor at uh, Catawba, uh, has been shooting me data to this point. Uh, we have eight times more requests for absentee ballots than we had at this same time in 2016. Some 200,000 people uh, have already requested absentee ballots. Um, he says it's interesting, though. 48 percent of them come from Democrats, only 18 percent from the GOP. In 2016, it was split 37-37. Why? Well, I think a lot of it is the Democrats are emphasizing that. You know, the Republicans are still encouraging people to vote absentee. Uh, President Trump just got an absentee ballot sent to him from the state of Florida. It's also interesting to know that you can get, you can request an absentee ballot and not use it. You can then still go vote in person and not use your absentee ballot, which is an important point. I think people are making a smart decision. I hope, and I, I really hope, that we don't have another giant, uh, that things don't get much worse with the coronavirus uh, the first week of November, but they could. We are going to have our election regardless. If things are terrible uh, a, a few weeks before the election, I think a lot of people will use those absentee ballots. Anna Bevan, there are a lot of people that saying Donald Trump's latest remarks about the postal system, and he's not going to fund them, and he doesn't want to, people to use absentee mail-in ballots, is essentially putting his thumb on the scales. Do you agree with that? I do think it's definitely influencing a lot of the Republican base and their thoughts on vote by mail. Um, but at the end of the day, we still have 72 percent of people, based on that same Civitas poll that you mentioned earlier, that are planning to vote in person. Yeah. All right, Rob. Uh, one of the voices uh, we're hearing a little bit is from the State Board of Elections. They're concerned about being able to get enough poll workers. Uh, they need 25,000 people uh, to show up to work the 2,700 
precincts that we've got in North Carolina. Uh, and historically, the average age has been 70, and many of them are saying they don't want to risk it during this virus. What happens if we don't get enough people to man the polls? It's a huge problem. That's why the board has resorted to something they're calling it the HEROES program. You're going to be a hero if you come out and work at the polls. Um, you know, we're going to have fewer polling places. We're going to have to move to bigger sites. I mean, there's talk now of using arenas and stadiums to have these to have the election. Um, it's it's a very difficult situation. It's why part of the reason I think a lot of people are voting by mail, and it's part of the reason this is such a tragedy that Trump is trying to, uh, as you say, put his finger on things by stopping people from voting by mail and and trying to per perpetuate this notion that it somehow you know will perpetuate fraud, which is just ridiculous. Yeah, are we right, John, to be concerned about voter suppression in this election? Uh, you should always be concerned about both in the integrity of ballots cast, whether people are legally casting ballots where they're supposed to live, where, where they're actually living, and suppression effects. So there's all sorts of things to be concerned about. It, with regard to vote by mail, as we've seen in recent elections, uh, while there is some chance of fraud, the real concern is mistakes. It's people who cast ballots right. incorrectly right. or, you know, for example, don't uh, they literally fill out a ballot and forget to send it in. I mean, there are some problems with encouraging people to vote by mail. You might reduce voter participation by doing so, but there are also some remedies like giving people clear instructions, allowing people to get information and advice if they need it. Ju Judge William Osteen, uh, Chris, released a, a a ruling this past week, uh, which uh, prevented some of the absentee ballots that perhaps have been thrown out in the past from being thrown out this time. Things like uh, mistakes with uh, spelling of names or, or so forth like that. How significant was that ruling? Well, I think it adds to the overall, I think it's very significant. It adds to the sort of the momentum. I think pe most people in America and in most people in North Carolina want a fair election they want they want uh, not you know people that make an honest mistake if their signature isn't exactly the one that they signed five years ago on their voter registration card. There's no reason to throw it out. I'm concerned about efforts across the country, primarily from Republican groups, to clear voter rolls of people just because they haven't participated in an election for three or four elections. If you choose not to vote, that doesn't mean you give up your right to vote. I'm a little worried about those kind of tactics as we get closer to the election. And particularly with this virus. Well, there was some good news on the fight against COVID-19 this week. Health and Human Services Secretary Mandy Cohen reports we're actually seeing a decline in the number of new cases, even though we had a little bit of a spike on uh, Thursday. Our positive test rate is in that 5 to 6 percent range that she's been hoping to get. Rob, I asked Dr. Cohen why she thinks we're having this decline. She says she thinks that people wearing masks social distancing is having a positive effect. you agree or disagree? Well, absolutely. I mean, we had Dr. Cohen on our radio show, too, and I can assure you that she knows more about this topic than this entire panel put together. If she says that's the case, I trust her. It, it stands to reason that that's the case. Uh, but she's really, you know, she's still fighting a very difficult situation here. It's like she's treating a cancer patient who neglected their tumor for a long time. She's trying to keep, you know, a lid on a situation <laughs> that was allowed to get under out of control by the right. national government, the failed response of the Trump administration. She's in a tough spot, but I, I think there's no doubt that that's having a beneficial effect, and, and we all got to keep after it. Anna Bevan, this week, she also uh, released the fact that there had been a mistake in the counting of the number of tests that we have had in North Carolina. And we had to reduce the number of uh, actual tests by some 200,000 people. She said this didn't affect the number of new cases or the percent positive test. Uh, how significant is that going to be? Are people going to pay attention to this or is it just uh, a correction, a minor correction? No, I think it actually does have a huge effect on how people um, are um like relating to the data, understanding the data, and even their confidence in the data that's coming out. This is not the first mistake that, that we've had with data in North Carolina, and I think that it does um, really affect the confidence level. John, uh, uh, last weekend, week, uh, the weekend before this one, uh, President Trump uh, announced that he, since the Congress wasn't going to do anything, he was going to reinstitute some benefits, some federal benefits, so far as unemployment was concerned. Not the $600 a week that, that people had been giving, uh, been getting, uh, but $400 a week. The catch was that North Carolina, the states, had to pitch in 100 of that uh, in addition to their regular unemployment insurance. Uh, Senator Berger and House Speaker Moore have urged our state to go forward with this. 
Cooper indicates he's willing. Is this going to work? It is. It's important to, to recognize the, the Trump administration later clarified that the state does not have to chip in the $100. So if a state wanted to just take the federal money and do $300 bonus uh, benefit per week, they could do that. I do think North Carolina will do 400 It was the most consequential of President Trump's executive actions. A couple of the other ones were kind of here, neither here nor there. Yeah. And the payroll tax thing might be consequential, but it is quite confusing at the same time. Chris, a lot of people were saying they didn't think he had the authority to be able to do this. What's your take on it? Well, I think it was bizarre to issue an executive order and three memos of questionable authority. And then I think he was almost daring Democrats to sue him to stop it as a political issue. The Democrats wisely chose not to do that. But I think most states are confused. Democrat and Republican governors are trying to figure out what to do, but not with just the unemployment, but the eviction uh, executive order, which really isn't an order at all. It's something they'll consider. And the fact that we'll suspend payroll taxes for a while and then the people then people have to pay them back. Meanwhile, their Social Security system is already having, right. uh, you know, has funding issues. It was a very bizarre, clearly politically motivated uh, 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 appeal. And, he, you know, nobody really knows what he meant. Rob, is this going to take some of the pressure off of our legislature to amend and improve our unemployment insurance benefits? I suppose. I thought I was just really struck this week by the, I don't know, the political flip-flop 180 that Berger and Moore engaged in. Here's a couple of uh, polit political leaders who have for a decade been waging a sustained, relentless war on unemployment insurance, making North Carolina's the stingiest in the country. And now they're coming out and say, oh, yeah, come on, man, we got to have unemployment insurance for everyone. It's like, <laughs> make up your mind. They, 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 it's, it's classic. They did the same thing on online education, where they've been championing it for years. Trump changes his mind, and all of a sudden, they don't like online, ed online education. Exact same thing, I think, was just a political move. I don't think it's born of any real commitment to helping people. Anna Bevan, part of all of this with people who are unemployed particularly is being able to make their utility payments. Now, the State Utilities Commission recently ruled that the public utilities companies, like Duke Energy and uh, some of the larger uh, publicly owned companies, could not shut off a person's utilities until at least after the first of next month. But the expiration of the executive order from Governor Cooper means that the city-owned utilities uh, could indeed do that. Uh, we're told that there are $258 million in unpaid utility bills. Uh, local governments are already hurting. This is, is hurting them even more. How are we going to deal with all these unpaid utility bills? Well, that, I certainly do not envy local governments having to, to figure out a solution to this problem because there's, they're sort of in a, a catch-22. They, they can't win in any scenario because if they do start collecting um, utilities, then they're, they're doing what's, what's different than the rest of, of the state and, and the offerings. And so it's just a really difficult spot. They've lost a lot of revenue. Monday's a big day in North Carolina. It's a date set by our legislature for schools to reopen, although some have already done it. Despite the recommendation of Governor Cooper for us to have a modified plan incorporating social distancing, uh, some one million students, or 66% of our school-aged children, are going to be going back using virtual learning. I want to ask each of you, some believe the big reason many systems are opening through online learning is because of the teachers union. John, you've said as much on our show. Do you think that's right or wrong? I still think I'm right. Uh, I think the facts clearly show that that is the case. Parents who don't want their students to go to school, of course, were always going to keep them home. So it wasn't parental pressure. They weren't going to send, if, if parents didn't want their children there, they were going to take the distance learning option anyway. So what this is really about is parents who wanted to send their students back to school being prevented so by uh, the North Carolina Association of Educators and its pressure on school boards to deny that option. That's pretty clearly what happened. Chris, I, I hear what John's saying, and I know that that is a line of thought. Uh, but you, you listen to parents sounding off, and they're saying they don't want to send their kids back to school. Chris? Yeah, it's a line of thought that is, you know, when there's a chance to attack the NCAE, folks like John attack the NCAE. This is about parents. This is about people worried about the safety of their, of their kids, of the, of the teachers, of the custodians, of the counselors at schools. Polls overwhelmingly show people are very concerned about the safety at school. The lot was made... Uh, about the American Academy of Pediatrics writing a, 
a, a report a while ago saying kids are better off if they go to school. They issued a follow-up saying unless there's an outbreak of COVID and public health officials advise otherwise, this is, I think we have to follow the science. We can blame the NCAE or blame whoever we want. The, 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 the coronavirus is still a huge problem in endangering people's lives. Rob, uh, the number of teachers who belong to NCAE has been declining steadily over recent years. Do they have that much clout or can they really be the ones to force the kids to, to learn online? Uh, I have a, a cousin who's a school teacher in a, in a western North Carolina county who described uh, a, a hearing at her, uh, her school board in which the teachers spontaneously got up one after the other. It had nothing to do with the NCAE. They got up one after another and said, we want to love our kids. We want to take care of them, but we're not willing to risk our lives to do it. And that's, that's what this is being driven by. It's a spontaneous movement. NCAE probably is playing a role in it, but you're right. They, they don't have the clout to pull this off. I'm sure they wish they did. Anna Bevan, uh, I saved you for last on this because I know you come from a family of educators. What's your take on this? Is NCAE stopping the, the uh, going back to the classroom? I, I definitely think that they are. I think it's really difficult to separate um, their statement and their desires and their, their list of, of demands from, from schools being largely virtual. One of the things I found interesting about this topic is that the State Board of Education and the Department of Public Instruction have said, uh, we've got to test these kids when they go back. And there was some initial thinking they had to go back to the classroom in order to be able to take these tests to find out exactly where they are, are learning. Uh, isn't there some irony here? We can't let them go back to the classroom, but we are going to let them go back to the classroom to take the test, John. Uh, there are many ironies. There are actually some nonprofits trying desperately to find solutions for parents who are stuck, who may lose their jobs, their children aren't going to learn anything for months. And so they're actually negotiating with school districts to have learning centers at public schools staffed by nonprofits, it's at which point the kids are at school. That, that's among the many ironies here. The bottom line is the parents who didn't want to send their children to public school never were going to. This was always about telling parents no. That's what happened. Uh, Chris, nobody disputes the fact that uh, it is best for our younger students, or as Judge Howdy Manning calls them, the little people, uh, to go back to the classroom. They can learn better from in-class instruction. Uh, are you a little disappointed? Perhaps we didn't make enough effort to get some of these uh, pre-K through three uh, grades in the classrooms this year? No, I'm disappointed that we have a federal government that has uh, advocated its responsibility and we're stuck here when other countries around the world figured it out a lot sooner. Uh, it also, and Rob mentioned this earlier, that uh, there are virtual charter, virtual for-profit schools that have been telling us for years they can educate our youngest kids and now all of a sudden it's terrible if our youngest kids are educated at home. So there's so many contradictions here. I think for the most part, our state officials are doing the best they can, responding to the science. Governor Cooper gave schools the flexibility, which is what Republicans have been demanding and is the right thing to do in this case because every county is different. And now they're blaming him and, and some giant teachers union that doesn't really exist for all these problems. I uh, read an interesting article this past week from Saul Kahn, who started the nonprofit uh, virtual learning uh, site Khan Academy, and he was talking about we can do better than this. Let's let's move on to the segment of the show people tell me all the time they love to hear, and that is asking the panel to tell us something we don't know. Rob Schofield, I'm going to start with you. All right. Well, Tom, next Wednesday, uh, Judge Max Cogburn is expected to uh, issue some uh, sentences in the Greg Lindbergh, Robin Hayes trial. Uh, we're expected to see stiff sentences for John Gray and Greg Lindbergh and the, bri and the attempted bribery of uh, Mike Causey. A little interesting that Robin Hayes prosecutors are now saying they're not recommending any time. It sort of stands in sharp contrast to the way the book was thrown at Jim Black several years ago. Anna Bevan, tell us something we don't know. So in the last segment, we spoke a little bit about school-age children, and I want to shift to a little bit older um, millennial generation, um, one I, I probably am a part of. You're but close to, yes, I got that. Yes, um, but 79% of, of millennials are engaged in the political process in a way that they've never been before because they really understand how lawmakers impact their daily lives through COVID. Oh, John, tell us something we don't know. In that Civitas Institute poll we mentioned a, a little while ago, 58% of North Carolinians have a favorable impression of Black Lives Matter, which you would expect, mm -hmm. and 70% have an unfavorable impression of defund the police, 
which you should also expect. Those are the two different ways to craft uh, political messages about crime and racial justice that we will see in the campaign. And you this raise fall. a great point because polls are only as good as the way the questions are posed. Good point. Chris Fitzsimon, tell us something we don't know. Well, we talked earlier about the uh, post office. I find it interesting. Pew did a study a couple months ago. 91% of Americans have a favorable view of the United States post office. And it's worth remembering 100,000 veterans work at the post office. They deliver mail for, they're, they're the 160 million people uh, rely on them. They deliver medicine to rural areas that Amazon and FedEx doesn't go to. I'm not sure it's a political winner to being att to attacking the post office and the veterans who work there. Well, you've heard our spin on the issues of the day to stay informed all during the week. Sign up for our free weekly email newsletter. Give your feedback and read my weekly column. Visit our website, ncspin.com, or catch NC Spin on Facebook. And while there, subscribe to that newsletter. It's free. And our podcast, too on the YouTube channel. Join us next week with more balanced debate for the Old North State. Until then, stay informed and watch out for the spin. Your life is more flexible and efficient than ever. And your energy is too. See how North Carolina's electric cooperatives are building a brighter future for the rural communities we serve at ncelectriccooperatives.com slash brighter. The big issue in 2020 is health care. Let's talk basics. You are the key to your own personal health, but there is strong evidence that if you have a relationship with a family physician, your quality of life will be better. You'll likely live longer and you'll have 33% lower health care costs. Your family doctor knows you, has your medical history, and can quickly diagnose health problems. Family Physicians, your trusted health care advisor for life. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNCTV network.